So now I come to Avicana. Uh, for me, this is now a biopharma. Very, very big megatrend. Um, very, very big investment for our family. Um, uh, it's, we made this investment because of uh, also people. Uh, Aras uh, was the one which uh, really convinced me. Uh, me and Moritz were visiting uh, the PDEC uh, in a couple of months ago. We've been there several times in the office in Toronto and um, we realized how his team is working together and uh, what they are capable of um, changing the world of uh, chemical pharma into biopharma. And uh, what this is all about, uh, Aras is the guy to tell him. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Europe after three years. It's the first time they, they're allowing us back here. Uh, my name is Aras Azadi and I'm the founding CEO of Avicana. We are a biopharmaceutical company based in Toronto, focused on plant medicine. Uh, our first products that have come to the market are based on cannabinoids. I think Michael has heard the story so many times that he asked me not to present Avicana and to present the trend, the renaissance of plant-based medicine. So. I actually prepared this presentation for this group. It's my first time presenting it, but we will obviously, as a good CEO, I will naturally talk about my company as well. But to take it back, the history of plant-based medicine is obviously something that humans have lived with for thousands of years. There's evidence that it goes back to up to 60,000 years where we're using plants for medicine. And I think this is very important. It's across Chinese medicine where, you know, there was a, a, the, the last encyclopedia in 1999, there was 9,000 different plant medicines. And something that I like to talk about is Avicenna, which is really what our company's named after. He's a, a ninth century Persian polymath that was regarded as a father of modern medicine. And he has these books called the Canon of Medicine that are about 600 pages each. There are six of them. I have it in my office. And just to give you some reference, cannabinoids represent one page, meaning we're really, really, really early stage in terms of understanding the value of plant-based medicine. And I think the argument is why? Why did we stop using plant medicine? Some of it is technical, some of it, some of it is economical. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit on that. One of the major gaps of plant medicine, or at least till now, was lack of standardization. When we look at pharmaceuticals, when we look at medicine, we like to have accurate dose, reputable products, consistent products. And when you're talking about historic or ancient medicine, there was a lack of standardization. And to some extent that was marketed as sort of snake oil. Lack of clinical evidence, real world evidence or RCTs, which are randomized controlled trials were not conducted in terms of plant medicine. The real question is why? And the answer is patentability. People did not want to spend the money to patent plant medicine that I can cultivate or I can grow. Therefore, it became an economical decision. Lack of understanding of the synergistic effect of plant medicine, meaning multiple compounds working on multiple receptors or multiple mechanisms of action. And that's what we call polypharmacology. When you take something that's plant medicine, you're typically looking at various compounds that are then interacting with various methods or various mechanisms of action. We're not used to that in what we call Western medicine. It's single compound, single target, and therefore more addiction, therefore more side effects. Challenges with patentability, we've discussed this, but it's been very difficult to patent plant-based medicine. And I think part of the renaissance of plant-based medicine is how we've been able to address all of this. We're doing that in my company in terms of cannabinoids and other compounds. And I think the rest of the world is following suit across various plant-based medicine compounds. And then one of the last things that's, I think, worth discussing is drug delivery. When you think about drug delivery, when you think about sophisticated transdermal or sustained release or even uh, intravascular, these type of products, when you're talking about plant medicine, were usually something like a tincture, something like an herb that you make a tea out of. So the drug delivery was always very primitive. I'm not sure if, mo if you guys know the story, but there is a huge theory around actually the activity or the involvement of the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers being oil guys, Texas, that was good, I think the timing is right, um, used synthetic compounds or believed in the opportunity of synthetic oil-derived compounds that they can patent. 
And that is really the emergence of Western medicine or what we call allopathic medicine. And through that process, it's what we call the, the Rockefeller medicine men. They went out there and they started educating the physicians to prescribe single compound patentable synthetic drugs, what we call chemical drugs. And at first there was a lot of resistance from the medical community you know, in early in the century when this was happening. And the way they were able to bypass that was through significant lobbying efforts, significant marketing education efforts, but funding allopathic medicine versus natural medicine. And to some extent, natural medicine became a bit of a taboo. It became a little bit of a snake oil and it became something that went into the periphery of the medical system. Today, when you talk to a physician, typically, and you offer or you want to try plant-based medicine, the physician usually shrugs that off and says, no, it's not going to work. Stick to your single compound. The actual gaps of allopathic medicine, from my perspective, and I think from the perspective of the medical community now, is that there's only been 1,200 drugs approved by the FDA. 1,200 drugs since 1950. We're talking about 53,000 plant medicines and only 1,200 drugs are approved. Why? Unlike the COVID vaccines, these things take a very long time. It takes a very long time to do the drug development, the drug delivery, the toxicity studies, phase one, two, three. So there is a major gap in terms of the allopathic chemical medicine takes a very long time and it is very expensive and that's generally related to concerns of safety and toxicity. With poor safety and toxicity, we need to test on multiple species. We need to test on healthy volunteers and then go to patients. And that makes the process expensive. That makes the process in terms of, again, drug development and clinical development expensive, hence why only 1,200 drugs by the FDA. There's also a lot of challenges in terms of side effects. And I'll touch on polypharmacology, but when you have a single compound, single receptor, single activity, that naturally leads to addiction and that naturally leads to side effects. And that's part of the concerns when you see things like the opioid crisis. When you're seeing a lot of other types of pharmaceutical-led crises within the world, and I believe that's one of the major reasons why we're seeing an emergence of plant medicine. So the renaissance of plant-based medicine, again, Michael asked me to kind of present this as a topic. Of course, it's one that is close to us. And I'm going to use within this presentation cannabis and cannabinoids as a case study, just because obviously it's relevant to me and a lot of information. But if you can see the number of publications, the number of clinical trials that have just grown within the last 10 years within cannabinoids, it's quite remarkable. A lot of this is happening in the European Union. A lot of it is happening in Germany. But this is showing that the medical community is now looking at plant-based medicine very differently. And I will touch on the cannabis plant and its various compounds, but we're also seeing similar trends within Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine is growing at a, at a massive rate. And post-COVID, there's a lot of drivers that is increasing the value of Chinese medicine. Something that I found interesting when I was doing my research for this presentation was there is a correlation between higher income, higher education levels, and more use of plant medicine. I would have personally thought it's the other way around. I would have thought it would be the developing countries that are more used to using this type of medicine. But the trend is the other way around. And I think the world and the population, the social drivers are actually leading to that as well. And that's something that, again, we're very excited to be part of. Going into cannabinoids, a major catalyst was Epidiolex. Epidiolex is a botanical but purified CBD compound put into a formulation that is for pediatric epilepsy. This is specifically for a couple of indications that are refractory, meaning that there is no solution. And this was the first FDA approved drug that had cannabinoids in it. Major catalyst for the industry, major catalyst for my business model because it was a validation. We started the company in 2016. This was approved in 2018. So this was a big significant move. And we as a company are today about three months away from having our first epilepsy drug approved in three countries in South America. So obviously this was again a major trend. Another trend we see which is really interesting and Germany does have a medical cannabis program is the prescription of medical cannabis. Today in Canada, there's about 300,000 patients that are leveraging or utilizing medical cannabis for clinical indications or what we call comorbidities, meaning symptom management, things like sleep, pain, anxiety, depression that are prevalent across a number of clinical indications. 
So it's a very exciting phase to see that. Today, I can tell you my company, we have 24 products across the largest pharmacy chain in Canada. It's called Shoppers Drug Mart. And every day we're seeing more and more growth. Every day we're getting more and more testimonials, but we're also generating clinical evidence. And I will touch on that as well. Some of you might have seen this documentary, uh, How to Change Your Mind. I think it's a great watch if you haven't. But this is another signal towards plant, herb, or fungi-based medicine emerging. So in addition to cannabinoids, in addition to Chinese medicine, we are now seeing a trend towards even psychedelics in terms of compounds that are allowing for potential solutions for a lot of unmet medical needs. And I won't dive too much into this. This is not my particular area of strength, but we are starting to look at that as, as a next generation pharmaceutical company. But I wanted to just touch on how this renaissance of plant medicine isn't limited to just Chinese medicine, Eastern medicine, cannabinoids, but it actually goes all the way into psychedelics, which is, you know, chemicals such as LSD and MDMA, but also psilocybin, which you guys would know probably as magic mushrooms. There's fairly significant clinical evidence around its use in depression, its use in addiction, in resetting the mind. So the point here is the world is opening up. There is a renaissance in terms of plant-based medicine, and I find that personally quite fascinating. Some of the major drivers, in my opinion, in terms of why plant-based medicine is emerging, we sort of, we, we kind of know it's already happening. This is my reasoning as to why. Polypharmacology and pharmacy, I'll touch on that. It's safety profile, I'll touch on that. Standardization, which we've improved. Advanced drug delivery systems, and now patentability. So I'm going to present various sort of drivers. Polypharmacology, I've touched on this a little bit. It's instead of a magic bullet, it's a magic shotgun, meaning multiple compounds, multiple receptors, multiple targets. The concept of single compound, single receptor is historic. It's chemical, it's synthetic. With cannabinoids, with other plant-based medicine, you can activate multiple receptors and that allows us to lower drug loads, allows us to modulate particular symptoms, allows us to reduce side effects. It's really important when you're thinking about more, more complex diseases, such as neurological disorders, such as cancer. It's not a simple thing where one target or one compound can fix it. So for things like that, the, mo the more complex polypharmacology, or again, multiple compound solution, is something that more and more advanced scientists, advanced pharmaceutical companies are looking at, including big pharma. Side effects I've covered. The cannabinoid case study I think is really interesting. Most people know the cannabis plant as weed, as what you get high from. In the cannabinoid or in, in the cannabis plant, you have over 100 cannabinoids. You have hundreds of flavonoids and terpenoids. It's essentially a factory for plant derived chemicals. And if that's cultivated in a sustainable way and you have the appropriate genetics, not only can you get this sort of polypharmacology version of multiple compounds, but you can even isolate and purify those. And, and I'll touch on that as well. So I think this is a major driver from a, from a clinical perspective as to why plant medicine is making a renaissance. So these are the multiple compounds I was referring to. Most of you will know that we do have our own endogenous can cannabinoid system. We call it the endocannabinoid system, main receptors being CB1 and CB2. These are across our entire body. So when you are ingesting or consuming or being, you know, delivered cannabinoids in terms of medicine, it is affecting various systems in your body from your neurological system to your GI system to even skin. We have a product that's going into a phase two clinical trial on a rare skin disease called epidermolysis bullosa that does not have a treatment today. And we've had very good signals in our earlier studies. Most people don't think that. And one of the false assumptions of that is, well, if cannabinoids can help a skin disease, I'm going to smoke a joint. No, it's a topical. It needs to be a cream and it needs to be the right compound. In fact, our studies on children. So I don't have a bunch of children smoking joints in a clinical trial. I, I get those kind of questions. Uh, safety and tolerability. So again, why are plant medicine or plant compounds interesting? We've been using them for thousands of years. If I go in the lab and I synthetically, whether it's biosynthesis or chemical synthesis, and I produce a new compound that has potential to be beneficial, I have to study it. I have to show that it's safe. 
I need to give it to multiple species, including monkeys. And I'm sorry if there is animal lovers here, but that process is not only painful, but it's expensive. With plants, we know for thousands of years that they're safe. There's particular plants that we know are not safe, right? But when you're thinking about the history of it, I think it's very, very important. The concept of whole plant, again, synergistic combination, you can call it a cocktail of compounds, is also safer. So the safety and tolerability not only makes the product safer, but it makes them less addictive. Below is a small table in terms of a cannabinoid case study again, and where we're comparing CBD and THC in terms of its dependence and its tolerability versus other compounds that are very typical. Nicotine, cigarettes, alcohol, anti-anxiety medication, and cannabinoids, interestingly enough, are substantially lower in terms of risk. Standardization. So again, when you think about plant medicine from 300 years ago, 400 years ago, you're thinking about an herb, a tincture, a tea. This is what we do. This, this is actual pictures from my facility in Colombia, and where we're taking the plant that has expressed high amounts of a particular compound we want, whether it's CBD, CBG, THC, we extract it. The first crude oil is called resin. That's about 70% pure in terms of the compound we want. We go into a distillate, that's about 85% compound, and then we purify it. So CBD in, crystal, in purified form is a crystal. That is what is being used in our epilepsy drugs. So it's not, again, what people perceive. So we have been able to standardize, and not just us, but other plant-based pharmaceutical companies have been able to standardize. And that standardization in the form of cultivation or agriculture is good agriculture and collection practices, in the form of extraction and manufacturing, good manufacturing practices. So the case study here is the FDA approved drug is plant derived, meaning you can standardize plant-based medicine. And this is something that again was not obviously prevalent. Advanced drug delivery. Again, you're thinking teas, tinctures, I'm thinking sustained release tablets. Something like a THC compound that has a psychoactive effect, something like the THC compound that could have an adverse event or an adverse effect if someone has too much of it. You take that compound and you release it in a sustained or controlled setting. And this is data from some of the drug development work we've done. You can now reduce the potential adverse events. Meaning with plant medicine, you can deliver it in a substantially more stable, consistent, and advanced way. And I think this is another reason why plant-based medicine is making a comeback. Consider something like psilocybin from magic mushrooms. It could have a significant adverse event if there's too much taken at this right time. There's a lot of popularity around microdosing. Consider psilocybin in the form of a slow-release drug that substantially reduces the potential for side effects. So again, advanced drug delivery is another driver. IP and patentability. You can patent plant medicine. It's not true. You can, I have eight patents that are in the process of getting validated and approved by the US government. This is a recent one we filed. I made sure that what I'm showing here is not gonna leak my intellectual property. But in this particular study, we actually looked at CBD and THC and we looked at its effect within animal models on seizure control. So this is again an epilepsy related project. And as you can see in the first one, and I'm not gonna get into all of them, in the first one, the seizure duration with THC actually went up. So again, if you think THC or weed is good for epilepsy, you're wrong. However, we have a particular ratio that I can obviously give away that includes a couple of cannabinoids that not only improved seizure control, but it was synergistic, meaning one plus one equals three, not two, three. And that alone is patentable. So for my epilepsy drug, not only is the particular ratio synergistic and patentable, but so is the drug delivery. So the argument that plant-based medicine can't be patented, I call BS on that as well. Cultural and economical, I'll go very fast. I think we all see the trend. I think after COVID, everyone's a little bit upset at the pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical industry. So there's certainly cultural post-COVID paradigm shift. People wanting to have better strong immunity, want to have less reliance on chemicals, less reliance on pharmaceuticals. So there's certainly that. This is the United States where it's not federally legal to sell medical cannabis or recreational cannabis, but you can see at a state level, most of the states are now medical or adult use. Canada has been fully legal for many years and 
there's gaps to that as well, but there's certainly a cultural movement. And in, in Germany, I think you guys are about a year away from legalization of recreational cannabis. Not something I recommend, but it's an interesting trend to see. So patient advocacy is an important one. In Canada, this was actually driven by epileptic patients and their parents. Their parents demanding that if there is a solution for their kids, why do they not have access to it? This is being driven by veterans that have post-traumatic stress disorder. This is being driven by pain patients that want to reduce their opioid use. We are involved in clinical trials where we're seeing that. So there's a lot of cultural impact, but also the economical ones. As I mentioned, it's very expensive to do drug development. And when you have these plants that are helping people, why not deliver them at a medical or pharmaceutical level, which is a trend again we're seeing. And then accessibility. The pharmaceutical pathway in which 1,200 drugs have been approved in the last 70 years means it's expensive. When it gets to the market, people want their ROI. People want their return on investment. And therefore, they're patented, they're protected, they charge thousands of dollars per drug. Where again, with plant medicine, I believe it's faster route to market and it makes it more accessible for developing countries. Our epilepsy program is launching in Brazil, Ecuador, Argentina, and Colombia first, where it's going to be substantially lower priced than Epidiolex. Just a final, just to wrap up, I'm going to go into an outlook. What are the current limitations of plant-based medicine? There's probably people in this audience that are skeptical, skeptical of what I'm talking about. So there is still cultural biases. There's still cultural biases towards this kid is up here talking about magic mushrooms and weed. I'm not, but there is still those that exist. There's slow rate of adoption because the, the pharmaceutical industry, starting with the Rockefellers and the synthetic compounds has essentially built a program or a platform for physicians to take a very slow adoption process to things that are plant medicine. And this is going to take time. Reluctance to invest. My company today, we're part of a Johnson & Johnson incubator for seven years. They can't kick me out. I've been still incubating, but they still have not invested. And it's a prime example as to why Big Pharma does not invest heavily into this area. They're seeing their sales decrease. However, they are not investing heavily into the area. And then, of course, standardization of regulations, meaning right now we are active in 18 countries. And I can tell you no two countries has the same regulations has the same standards, has the same pharmacopoeia for testing. It's all very, very different. It's a lot of work. So these are the limitations as to why plant medicine hasn't happened. One of my biggest uh, criticism of the industry or the movement towards plant medicine is mixing of recreational with medical. Medical was legalized in Canada three years before recreational in terms of nationally. Medical was growing, patients were learning, physicians were training patients on how to utilize these products appropriately, and then they legalized recreational. Now the same patient can walk into a dispensary and buy weed. Physicians are now saying, it's the same thing. Why am I gonna take my time to learn? Why am I gonna go through the education process? So I actually believe countries need to slow down on the recreationalization and focus on the medical, because that's where the real value is. The opportunity, again, accessibility and economic suitability. I think I touched on that. Uh, environmental sustainability. We cultivate our cannabis in Colombia, the country of Colombia, at 5% of the cost of Canada United States. We are USDA organic certified and can do so in an environmental sustainable way. We're not using yeast or chemical synthesis. We're using the plant. It absorbs carbon through its process. We harvest it. We then get the, the natural botanical compounds. A lot of public support and paradigm shift in terms of plant-based medicine, we're seeing that. Potential for phytochemicals and phyto, uh, the, the polypharmacology, again, lower symptoms, better efficacy, lower drug load. Unmet medical needs. We still have thousands of unmet medical needs. We still have thousands of clinical indications or pathologies that we do not have solutions for. At the rate that the FDA is approving drugs or we're developing drugs, it's going to take forever. Michael's telling me to wrap up. Um, I'm going to spend one minute on this. This is what we do in Canada. We do our drug development. We work with the biggest clinical institutions. We have our products not only in the pharmacies, but in the hospitals. And everywhere we, that we sell our products, we're generating data. That data allows us to then optimize our clinical protocols as we go into phase two, phase three trials. So we are a revenue generating company, active in 18 countries, but the focus is always on the drugs. And this is just a map of where we're active across various products, whether it's dermatology, 
uh, medical, and then across raw materials that we're exporting to other pharma companies. And that, that's it. Thank you very much. Aras, thanks a lot uh, for preparing our own presentation about this, uh, which you never did before. I think uh, it was amazing. I wanted to give the audience uh, really this mega trend, uh, what is coming up now. And I think you did a great job here and uh, uh, really clap, clap my hands one more time. Thank you.